Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing great this morning. I hope you feel fit in the environment that you're in today. I loved, I loved the terminology that she had in that last talk. I think it was great. And just so you understand my background, I'm a drug design chemist by training. I was actually designing oncology drugs in a PhD program at Arizona State. And from that, I had to do a lot of genetic work. And so we're going we're gonna to be looking at a lot of gene sequencing today. And in the context of gene sequences, we're going to be looking at phylogenetic trees of the endocannabinoid system. So I want to kind of get an idea of the background. Is pretty much everybody in here a medical professional? MDs, NDs, no? Do we have any evolutionary biologists in here today? No, thank God, because, oh, darn it. <laughs> so I have to give the, you're not going to believe anything I say. <laughs> I have to give the disclaimer. My perspective on evolutionary biology is when I was doing drug design, we were working on a enzyme that had not been crystallized, and so we had no structure to work with. And so we used gene sequences to look for what are known as conserved regions in the gene sequence because the conserved region of the gene sequence often is a sequence that is important for the active site of an enzyme. And that was what our focus was in drug design was enzyme active sites. And so I'm not an evolutionary biologist, so don't expect this to be a good evolutionary biology talk. This is a biochemistry talk from a, a uh, uh, conservation of gene sequences perspective. So it's important to understand the, the function of endocannabinoids because these molecules over time have evolved in different species and not all species can produce all of these endocannabinoids. For example, we, pro we produce um, arachidonic ethanolamide from arachidonic acid. Well, there are some species of insects that don't produce arachidonic acid, so they can't produce, like Drosophila cannot produce arachidonic eth ethanolamide, but Drosophila can produce two arachidonic glycerol. And they don't have cannabinoid receptors, so we really don't know why the Drosophila is producing an endocannabinoid when it doesn't have an endocannabinoid receptor. And be, we're gonna be looking at some of the, the receptors that are non-endocannabinoid receptors that bind to endocannabinoids as a result of that. So when I look at these, I see these as derivatives of arachidonic acid. And, and you probably know that arachidonic acid is an important essential fatty acid, meaning we don't necessarily produce enough of it. We can produce some arachidonic acid from omega-6s. But one of the problems that I have right now with our understanding of the endocannabinoid system is that most literature research in endocannabinoid system is focusing on just these two endocannabinoids. Hmm. And if they're both derived from arachidonic acid, does anybody see the problem with that? Well, yeah. Because we get a lot more other essential fatty acids in our diet other than arachidonic acid, right? And it turns out that these these arachidonic acid derivatives are strong cannabinoid receptor agonists and they bind differently to CB1 and CB2 and they have different functions in the human body. Um, you'll hear neurobiologists talk about um, arachidonal ethanolamide, which is also known as anandamide. They refer to this as a partial agonist and they, t they talk about it as being tonic in nature. So, 2 arachidonic glycerol is referred to as phasic because what these molecules do is they modulate neurotransmission. And so, this one is referred to as tonic because it's kind of always there and it's always kind of tuning in neurotransmission. And this one kind of comes in when there are bursts of neurotransmission. And it's really important, and this is one of the most complex, you know, the human endocannabinoid system is one of the most complex that, is, that has been uh, characterized so far. And so when we look at some of these other molecules, this is a derivative DHA. And so now we transition from looking at just omega-3 or omega-6s, now we're looking at some of the essential fatty acids that are derived from omega-3 fatty acids. And 
it turns out that the DHA derivative of ethanolamine is referred to as synaptamide because when it was originally discovered, it was discovered by neurochemists that were looking for things that stimulated synaptogenesis. So who wants to go out and get some DHA supplements now? Good Lord, if I could make myself smarter by changing my omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, hmm, sounds, sounds promising to me. Um, and you'll hear me refer, when I talk about the endocannabinoid system, you'll hear me refer to what's known as endocannabinoid tone. You know, and our endocannabinoid tone is largely built upon our intake of essential fatty acids and our ability to convert those fatty acids, whoa, convert those fatty acids into these molecules that we refer to as endo endocannabinoids. And so if we are efficient at producing endocannabinoids from our essential fatty acids, we would have a positive endocannabinoid tone. And if we're inefficient, we would say that we have a negative endocannabinoid tone. And it's important because the balance of omega-3s and omega-6s is so important in this. One of my favorite researchers, Oliver Manzoni, has done some groundbreaking work with mice. And one of the things that he's shown with mice is that mice that are fed a diet that's deficient in omega-6s, or pardon me, wow, there's a slip, diet deficient in omega-3s. There is no diet deficient in omega-6s, is there? No doesn't exist. But there, it's easy to have a diet that's deficient in omega-3s. That's a standard American diet because of all of our consumption of the industrial seed oils. I won't call them food oils because they're not. They're industrial seed oils and they're good for one thing, lubrication. Uh, but what Oliver Manzoni has shown is that mice lose neuroplasticity in the absence of omega-3s. Who in here would like to have less neuroplasticity? Sign me up. Maybe I could become president. So, <laughs> we know that in mice, they lose neuroplasticity if they don't get omega-3s. And we know that the DHA ethanolamide endocannabinoid was discovered by people that are looking for things that stimulate synaptogenesis. Paints a compelling picture for me. Does it not for you to quit drinking or eating omega-6s? So. The last molecule that's up here is another one that is a serotonin derivative of arachidonic acid that has endocannabinoid function. There's also a dopamine endocannabinoid. And so the point is, I want you to understand that your diet influences your endocannabinoid system dramatically, and we're just scratching the surface on these molecules. And we need a lot more research that doesn't just focus on the first two that were discovered. And actually, if, if I put this slide presentation into historical order, we're going backwards. Because the endocannabinoids were actually discovered after the receptors were discovered, and the receptors were, were discovered after THC was characterized. And so our whole understanding of the endocannabinoid system is backwards because we discovered, we, meaning Raphael McCoolum, discovered THC in the 60s, and then we thought THC just had some magical property with neural membranes until uh, 1990 when the first cannabinoid receptor was discovered. The second cannabinoid receptor was discovered in 1993, and then the endocannabinoids were discovered in the late 90s. And so our understanding of this is built backwards, and we have a lot of laws associated with cannabis that put a lot of roadblocks in front of the researchers that were doing this kind of work. Okay, so when we look at the, the gross physiology of cannabinoid receptors, you'll often hear people say that CB2 receptors are found in the immune system. Well, they are, that's true, and they're found in a lot of other places in the body, and they have a lot of diverse functions. One of the primary functions of CB2 is in the blood-brain barrier and in the gut barrier, CB2 is absolutely essential for normal permeability. It maintains normal blood-brain barrier permeability by controlling cytochrome or cytochrome cytokine inflammation, and so CB2. You'll often hear that it was that it is in the immune cells, but it was it was discovered in the rat spleen, which is why people think it's only in the immune cells. Uh, it is it is found in a large number of other cells besides immune cells and has some pretty diverse function. CB1. 
I focus primarily on the synaptic function of CB1 because I think that that's probably the most important function of CB1. But CB1 also uh, has influences on some of our very uh, fundamental physiological homeostatic processes like eating. Everybody knows that, you know, cannabis is, is really important in the oncology population and I want to be one of the few people that are out here saying cannabis does not cure cancer. It's not a magic bullet. It's a really important toolbox in the, in the toolbox of the oncologist because Western medicine has nothing for the anti-emetic effect that cannabis has. Western medicine has nothing to improve appetite in patients with cachexia. And so like every other thing in the toolbox of the oncologist, cannabis is one thing that needs to be applied with all of the other tools. So when you hear people say that cannabis cures cancer, turn and walk please. That's not good science, that's bro science. And I work in the cannabis industry, but I am unpopular in the cannabis industry because of my stance on good science versus bro science. So uh, some of the other things that are really important uh, within CB1 function are motility in the gut. Um, this is why CB, CB1 antagonists like like THC are really good for patients with Crohn's and IBS, those spastic conditions of the gut can be quieted down with CB1 receptor agonists. Okay, uh, a little bit more closer look. I've been doing a lot of talks about met metabolism. Nation and I just spoke at Low Carb USA and I tailored this talk to fit the, the overall metabolic function of CB1 and CB2. And it's interesting because when you look at things like CB1 stimulates glucose uptake in adipose tissue, this is not a sunny side, side up egg. That's supposed to be an adipose cell. And in adipose cells or sunny side up eggs, uh, CB1 increases glucose uptake, it increases insulin sensitivity, and it increases the storage of fats. But one of the weird things about the population studies of cannabis users and animals is that in, in these studies, cannabis users are typically lower in BMI than the general population. Well, does that make sense when you think about CB1 stimulating the uptake of glucose and the storage of fat? Well, no, it doesn't. And I call this the stoner paradox. We'll come back and look at this a little bit later in the talk. But I just want to confuse you up front and bring it back. I mean, it's confusing because we have these conflicting things between cell line tests and animal models. And this is often true in biochemistry because, you know, we probe these type of activity using pharmacological methods like can, um, cannabinoid receptor antagonists. And we probe with, with agonists pharmacologically. And we, you know, we look at different cellular functions and often they don't add up in organism level studies. So we'll come back and take a look at this because there's more to this when you look at the organism because of all of the things that our previous speak, spoker, sp spoker? speaker spoke about in terms of how different cells within the organism have to cooperate. And so whenever you look at cell line or enzyme level data, you always have to recognize that there's a limitation and when we put that data into the context of an organism level study, it will likely not necessarily fit. Okay, so this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of CB1 function. This is what I think is the most important part of CB1 function, the synaptic model. So in this model, on the left, we have a, an excitatory uh, neuron, and on the right, we have an inhibitory neuron. And they come together, and they, they um, innervate with a postsynaptic neuron to do their thing. And their thing is neurotransmission. What we, what we see with endocannabinoids is the endocannabinoids are pr produced postsynaptically by specific enzymes. And we'll talk, we won't talk too much about these enzymes in terms of the, the uh, genetic evolution. But just know that there are enzymes that produce these endocannabinoids. And not all organisms produce these enzymes. And so what we see here is the most complex endocannabinoid system that exists in nature as we know it today. And so these endocannabinoids are produced 
postsynaptically, they're transported, they go to receptors presynaptically, and they modulate the release of neurotransmitters. They don't stop the release of neurotransmitters, they modulate it. And so, like the anti-lock brakes on your car, they, they tune the release of these neurotransmitters so that your central nervous system does not overload itself with information or, or neurotransmission. And so, there's, there are direct relationships between these receptors and the release of neurotransmitters. And, and when the, the receptor sites have been bound, the endocannabinoid is then broken down into its, uh, its individual synthetic components. And so we have enzymes that do, that do that as well. And so there are organisms that have the enzymes that to produce some of these endocannabinoids that don't have cannabinoid receptors. And there are organisms that have the enzymes that break down endocannabinoids that don't have you know, the cannabis, the cannabinoid receptors. So, in, in general, when we look at this, it's a really important thing for the overall longevity of the central, central <coughs> excuse me, of the central nervous system. And because we have such a complex, good Lord, sorry. We have such a complex central nervous system, it's important that our bodies can regulate neurotransmission and especially excitatory neurotransmission because excess glutamate neurotransmission is associated with chronic neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS. And so this is where the neuroprotective effects of phytocannabinoids are important. Okay, are we ready for, <clears throat> for the gene sequences? So this is what's known as a phylogenetic tree, and this is a phylogenetic tree for the CNR1. CNR1 is the name of the gene that encodes for CB1 receptor. And so you can see from this that there are some differences in spacing, and if you're not an evolutionary biologist, what, what this tells us is that there is a large number of species that produce the cannabinoid receptor. And, you know, some of these are, um, you know, advanced organisms, organisms like the primates, and some of these are simple organisms. And, you know, some of these organisms, the elephant shark is referred to as an evolutionarily resistant species because it has not evolved in, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And so when you see um, evolution, evolutionarily resistant species like the elephant shark that are expressing cannabinoid receptors that have a high degree of homology with the human receptor, it means that this receptor has something very fundamental with our basic physiology. That's the main thing I want you to, to come out of this is that when you see a phylogenetic tree like this that spans from mammals to invertebrates, it means that that, that gene is really important in terms of the basic uh, function. And it's, it's funny because in different organisms, you know, I look at a lot of different studies and there are bird studies that have shown when birds are treated with cannabinoid receptor antagonists, it changes their song pattern. So by blocking their cannabinoid receptor, it's, their song patterns are fundamental to their entire social structure. And if you can interrupt that with a cannabinoid receptor antagonist, that's a pretty profound evolutionary um, effect right there. In mice, uh, cannabinoid receptor antagonists in mice pups inhibits suckling. Well, that's a horrible thing to change evolutionarily. You know, when we, when we look at, at how receptors and different genes evolve over time, there's a lot of these receptors that are, you know, genes that evolve faster than others. And this is one of the ones that has, has evolved very slowly over time. And 
part of it is because there's a lot of crossover. And what I mean by crossover is this, so this is the enzyme monoacylglycerol lipase that breaks down to arachidonylglycerol. Um, COX-2 is the enzyme that, that we are familiar with because of the, the class of drugs, non anti-inflammatories, right? COX-2 inhibitors block the production of inflammatory prostaglandins. And remember that prostaglandins are fatty acid derivatives as well. And it turns out that COX-2 can metabolize the endocannabinoids as well. And this is why when I look at the phylogenetic tree, I want to look at things like COX-2. I also want to look at some of the other enzymes in the human endocannabinoid system that are bound by the endocannabinoids. Um, so the, the last one here, FAH, is the enzyme that breaks down uh, arachidol ethanolamide, also known as anandamide. And so there's, there's some, some um, authors that believe that by blocking COX-2, we actually have a little bit of an antidepressant effect, because remember, anandamide was derived, the name anandamide was derived from Sanskrit uh, ananda, which is bliss. Okay, so this is the phylogenetic tree for the cannabinoid receptor 2. And CNR2, the gene CNR2 encodes for uh, CB2 receptor. And here is where there's a lot of disagreement within evolutionary biology. There's, there, there was a split at one point where there was one organism in the phylogenetic tree that produced a mutant CB1. And there are some people that believe that that mutant CB1 is what became CB2 evolutionarily. And the reason they believe that is because there is a high degree of homology. And everybody get what I mean when I say homology? There's a lot of, you can see the similarity in each of these gene sequences. That's what homology is. There's a high degree of homology between CB1 and CB2, which suggests that there's an evolutionary relation between the two. But there's only 44% homology, which, which means that it, it probably is within the same species that the split happened. And so this is one area where there needs to be a lot more study. I mean, I think the first study that I actually could pull up on the evolutionary biology of the endocannabinoid system was 2000. And then there was really nothing till 2005, and then there was 2007. And I think, you know, you could count on both hands the number of published articles on the evolution of the endocannabinoid system. So, this is a representation that I used um, at a conference on low-dose naltrexone, and the reason I wanted to put it up here is because endocannabinoids and phytocannabinoids are referred to as promiscuous receptor binding because they bind to cannabinoid receptors, they bind to um, vanilloid receptors, they bind to opiate receptors, and because of that, when we talk about the evolutionary biology, we have to think about, okay, if an organism produces endocannabinoids but it doesn't have cannabinoid receptors, well, there must be some other function in that organism. And, and likely, you know, TRPV is a suspect to look at in organisms that don't have cannabinoid receptors. And in, the vanilloid receptors are important for the sensation of pain and heat. And over their evolution, the vanilloid receptors have actually split into receptors that can, that can sense heat, pressure, and acidity. And this is the evolutionary tree for the TREP receptors. And it looks like it's not as diverse as the cannabinoid receptors, but there's a large number of organisms that have these receptors. And it's there's the elephant shark again. It seems like because it's evolutionarily conserved, it's an ancient gene, it's probably pretty important for a lot of fundamental processes. Um, CB2, I wanted to come back. We're not going to look at much more in terms of phylogenetic trees. Um, I want to take this back into physiology again and leave you with some of, some of the physiological things that you as practitioners can be looking at to help your patients that have issues with their endocannabinoid system. 
So CB2, we talked a little bit earlier about the, um, the neurological importance of CB2. So microglia and astrocytes. Uh, CB2 has a profound effect on cytokine inflammation, and as we all know, cytokine inflammation is the backbone of most chronic neurodegenerative diseases. Um, one last phylogenetic tree, FAAH, this is the enzyme that breaks down the, the endocannabinoid eth uh, arachidonyl ethanolamide. Um, just notice that there's a lot of different enzymes that have this, but to me, when I look at this, I see there's less um, single cell organisms and there's more mammals on this. So there's something about this enzyme that tends to be more, uh, it's found more often in the complex organisms like us. Okay. When we look at metabolism, we talked a little bit earlier about um, obesity and BMI. Um, this study was looking at uh, mice and what they were saying was that uh, they concluded the inability of omega-3 fatty acids to reduce adipose tissue and serum levels of classic endocannabinoids might contribute to lack of beneficial effect of these lipids on glucose homeostasis in type 2 diabetes clients. Well, remember that the classic endocannabinoids are from omega-6s. So they kind of missed the boat on this. And when we look at CB1 and CB2 receptor function in terms of how they influence um, fat mass. Whoops. Um, we see that there are some influences based on the expression of RNA for insulin and uh, glucose uptake proteins. And so this once again I don't think that this fully explains the, the role of the endocannabinoid system in how our, our body distributes and stores adipose tissue. When we look more deeply into this, the CB1 receptor actually is downregulating mitochondrial function. Well, that doesn't fit into what we would think is positive for overall health. But when you look at it, it seems like the insulin receptor is central to the ability of the endocannabinoid system to either have a positive or negative effect on our disposition of adipose tissue. And, and it's directly related to how insulin influences mitochondrial function. And there's an interplay between that toll-like receptors and the cannabinoid receptors. We look at endocannabinoid system function in adipose tissue. And it is actually, CB1 receptor is actually blocking the carnitine shuttle. Well, that doesn't bode well for the uh, ketogenic diet, as it would seem, right? We look at the endocannabinoid system and brown adipose tissue versus white adipose tissue, and we see things like uh, increase in fatty acid uptake in white adipose tissue, which we would think would probably lead to obesity. Uh, we look at fasting. Uh, fasting is influenced and influences the endocannabinoid system. And the stoner paradox, uh, we, we see in mice that uh, adult male mice that have dietarily induced obesity, and remember when you're inducing dietary obesity, omega-6s are really, really good at that, but omega-3s are not. Uh, we look at the gut gut function, there's a, a strong interplay between cannabinoid receptors and the immune system in terms of how gut permeability is controlled. And it turns out that gut permeability has an interplay with, um, with the microbiome. And so the endocannabinoid system influences the microbiome and the microbiome influences the endocannabinoid system. There's a lot of great mouse studies on how um, there are specific um, gut microbiota that are influenced by phytocannabinoids, and there seems to be a protective effect. When we look at the phytocannabinoids, delta-9 THC, um, and this is for clinicians, I think this is a really important thing to look at. There's a genetic reason why oral consumption has a 7 to 72 hour range of half-life for the physiological effects of THC. 
horrible, horrible um, pharmacological profile. And that's oral, inhaled, really predictable three to four hour half-life, and really predictable response. There's a genetic variation in cytochrome 2C9s, which is the cause of this, because oral consumed THC goes through first pass metabolism. And if you have uh, polymorphisms in your 2C9, you are likely going to be either an ultra fast or ultra slow metabolizer of delta 9 THC. Uh, CBD, which is touted to cure everything, is really important. I think that it should be treated like an essential nutrient, but I wouldn't say that it's going to cure your cancer. Um, has an incredibly long half-life. So when you're thinking about dosing, these things are really important. Um, I love beta caryophylline and the reason I have this in here is because beta caryophylline is a CB2 selective agent. And it's also found in some of my favorite foods. So clove, black pepper, shiso. Anybody know shiso from your Japanese restaurant? If you don't, next time you get sushi, order shiso with one of your sushi rolls. It's one of the most brilliant herbs that exists on the planet. Uh, myrcene, myrcene and limonene. I put these two here to contrast them because most modern chemovars of cannabis have been bred to either produce myrcene and are called indicas or they produce high levels of limonene or pinene and they're called sativas. Well the indica and sativa are, um, how many f-bombs can I drop when I think about how much of a gross generalization they are. The thing is, strain names don't mean anything. You need to think about these as chemovars because myrcene has profound pharmacological activity. We're gonna, everybody mind if we go a little bit over into the Q&A? We got a couple more slides, we don't have a lot, but I think that this is really important. So myrcene's activity can actually be blocked by the drug naltrexone which implies that myrcene is an opiate receptor agonist. And so when you think about pharmacological utility, high myrcene strains, which have been bastardly called indicas, can be really good for pain management. And especially if you're doing an oral preparation that has an extremely long half-life, this can be something that has very profound positive effects for cancer patients that have metastatic pain because that pain is not touched by many things and as you know opiates are probably not the thing that you want to manage that pain with. Uh, on the, the ups, the positive side, I, I refer to mercy, high mercine strains as being kind of, of um, heavy and dark they're really good for sleep and they're really good for pain, but you don't necessarily want to go drive a front end loader when you're consuming a high mercy strain, especially if you're consuming it orally. Uh, and I refer to limonene as being more light. Everybody, everybody knows the smell of citrus and everybody knows that it makes you feel good, right? I mean, this is why citrus is in cleaning products because limonene has a positive uplifting feeling and high limonene strains tend to give you a a kind of uh, mindful and, you know, uplifting high. And you'll often hear them referred to as sativa, which doesn't really mean anything. But um, there was a study in Japan in an institution, so it was pretty well controlled. They showed that just by smelling limonene essential oil in a cotton ball in a mental institution, they reduced the consumption of pharmacological antidepressants. That's pretty powerful, I think. So, to tie this back into evolution and how we co-evolve with our foods, I really would have loved to have been able to do a, a co-evolution of how phytocannabinoids produced by plants influenced our evolution, but there's really no data on it yet, and I would be sitting up here making stuff up. But what we do know is that part of our agriculturalist evolution, we've included a lot of things like spices. And this is one of the things that I want to caution you about when you're reading mouse studies. How many mice are consuming beta caryophylline rich herbs when they're eating a high fat diet? Well, probably not unless there's, they're Ayurvedic mice, right? Anybody know any Ayurvedic mice? I bet they smell good. But it's important when you look at these studies that are looking at high fat diet, number one, recognize 
is that high fat diet just omega sixes? Well, for mice, it likely is. Or is it just saturated fat? Well, probably. And there are some issues with that. I mean, I don't want to know what a high fat diet does. I mean, we already see that in the general American population, right? It's not a good outcome when we look at high omega-6 fats. But the thing that's often overlooked is how do these phytochemicals from our culinary herbs influence our metabolism and our microbiome? And I think that that's the take home message is we've evolved to develop receptors and enzymes for endocannabinoid system that, that influences our basic things like hunger, you know, uh, extinction of fear. These things are, are primal uh, in terms of our neurological development and it's important that, that we can include these kind of things in our diet to modify our endocannabinoid system so that we can have a healthy endocannabinoid system. Okay, with that, do we have any questions? It's interesting, you mentioned uh, naltrexone, uh, LDN, low-dose naltrexone, five milligrams a day, uh, is uh, as maybe in my uh, uh, antiquated uh, history, I've been touted as an anti-aging uh, cure-all, no downsides, but you just mentioned it, it blocks something perhaps useful, but is in our daily, uh, uh, normal daily function of our body. Do you have any comments on L uh, LDN in a, a good or a positive or negative way? So. Low-dose naltrexone, one of the positive effects of low-dose naltrexone that's not observed in high-dose is upregulation of the opiate receptors. And, you know, there's other, there's other things that low-dose naltrexone does. It is an antagonist of toll-like receptors, so there's an immune component that's really important. Um, the, probably the most important thing that low-dose naltrexone does is it also is blocking the um, opiate receptor the opiate growth factor receptor. And I think that that's probably one of the more important things. I don't think that, you know, when I, when I mentioned that, that the effects of, of myrcene were blocked by naltrexone, that's high dose. Typically, a pharmacological dose of naltrexone that will block um, an opiate receptor agonist is high dose. Uh, do you have any uh, um, do and or don't um, thoughts on uh, LDN as a... Uh long-term uh, anti-aging protocol? Um, my understanding is not from the clinical side, so I can't really comment on that. Nisha would be a better person, but she has the, the clinical experience with low-dose naltrexone. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Super interesting. Uh, obviously, CBD is everywhere, and there's tons of hype around it, and that could be a whole talk. But what, in your opinion, what do you think that there are benefits for CBD and what would be kind of the top ones in your opinion? Neuroprotective effects. I mean, the, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has a patent on the neuroprotective effects of CBD and they name the NMDA receptor system and the AMPA receptor system as the primary targets. And remember, the NMDA receptor system is linked to almost every chronic neurodegenerative disease. And so I would say, number one, I'm not going to say that CBD cures anything, but it's the, if I were to take any, you know, phyto compound on a daily basis, it would be CBD. And simply because it's just really, it's a really good tonic for so many different things. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you, Steve. Let's give him a big round of applause for that great yeah. talk. <laughs>